So it's a great pleasure to talk to you today, Dr. Renuka Ramrup. I hope I'm saying it correctly. Yes. And you've been studying uh, how young people actually learn to read when adults don't set out to teach them, but instead allow them to decide when and how to learn. Um, I've read your study, but I'd love you to share with everybody else what are some of the most interesting points from the research that you've done. Oh, what has been so fascinating is that um, children don't actually need to be taught to, to read. They can do it all by themselves. And I have looked at many children, and you know, from research, reading other people's research and looking at kids uh, who have uh, who have come to me. And the one thing that's completely outstanding is that they can do it. They can read by themselves. All they need to be able to read by themselves is a supportive adult, um, a close bond with their, their family, lots of talking, lots of storytelling, um, and a print-rich home. That's one of the things that John Holt also talks about, you know, having a print-rich home. So that's basically the ingredients you need. And then the child is able to pick up the reading completely by themselves. Yeah. So really it's about being immersed in a reading culture rather than um, sort of having to be taught, it seems to be yes. what you're saying. Yes, mm. most definitely. Uh, if you, even if you look at um, Freire, who did um, uh, literacy development with adults, and if you look at, there was a study done in Denmark uh, with a um, sort of a self-directed learning center with children there who, who started reading. And what they found is that actually for children to go from showing an interest in reading to becoming fluent readers, you only need 30 hours, at the most 30 hours. And if you think about going to school and that whole process is dragged out, you know, for so many months and years before you can be considered a fluent reader, it's quite telling. So you really need 30 hours. But in that 30 hours, the key thing is that the person must want to read. Right. The desire for want to, to read must be in that person. And that desire can come out of anything. It could come out because you are seeing everyone around you wanting to read. Uh, a reading and then you want to do it or that desire can come from you uh, there was an example in, in an Israeli study where the person wanted to um, watch the Harry Potter movies and the parents said no but we have to read the books first and they were like okay so that was the first time this person picked up the book and started reading finished all the Harry Potters and then went on to watch so there was motivation so I think that deep desire, that drive to learn must be there. And then it all falls into place. So 30 hours of coercion is not going to help you, but 30 hours of really wanting to do it is going to be what's needed. Yes. Yeah. So in that 30 hours of, uh, of, um, of uh, when you, from the desire to read till the time you become a fluent reader, that will also take its own pattern because every child is unique. There is no set way to say this is how you need to read. Now, in, uh, for example, in schools, we have the, uh, the, the sort of most common method is the phonic method. And if you actually look at it, you know, it is just another example of curricular management to take something and say, okay, let's see how we're going to manage this. And the reason why most um, educational institutions will choose the phonic method is because it seems to be the best um, way in which you can mark progress. So, you know, so it's just, it's just an easy method to say, okay, now we can do this, tick that off, tick that off, and we move on. So there is the sense of uh, measurement and progress, which is what educational institutions are all about. So, but if you look at a, 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 a person who's now going to uh, decide, I want to read, and in that 30 hours where they go from wanting to read to fluent reading, that pattern could be anything. You know, it could be 
um, asking questions. It could be taking something and sort of figuring it out on your own. It could be going the phonic method, phonetically looking at words because children have phonological awareness because they, they are speaking uh, from the time they're born, they are chatting to everyone around them. So they're, they're, their phonological awareness is there. And then being able to take that and transfer it into the pictures they are seeing in terms of the symbols that they're reading and somehow they will figure that out. And before you know it, you will have someone who reads fluently. And, and in all of that research, did you come across any cases of dyslexia um, in natural learning? Um, the cases that came my way were actually people who did go to school. So they were already labeled as dyslexic and you know, were sort of having all sorts of issues around that. Um, I can safely say that the one person who sort of came with that label over time, it disappeared. So, you know, she's, uh, she's, she's able to read and, you know, function quite well. She's, she's in school now and she func functions quite well. And, but you, uh, but from other uh, readings and, you know, other people's research, you, I, I find that, um, you know, I'm not an expert on dyslexia. And I, I don't know all the ins and outs about new, you know, the neurology and all of that. But what I do know is that a lot of a lot of people out there, when they go into the institutional uh, uh, in, into institutions, and then learning is now the cornerstone in terms of, of what will decide your success. That becomes the key thing to say. I mean, that's what everybody wants. When you go to school, you need to become a fluent reader because if you're a good reader, it's going to determine the rest of your academic life. You will either be labeled a poor learner or an or a outstanding learner, depending on your ability to read, because that's the measurement. Um, so if you take somebody who goes to the natural process, I mean, the interesting thing is the age range from le uh, of learning can be anything from four to 14 years old. Mm. So if you have a 10 year old who's sitting in a school, okay, and now everyone's going, oh my goodness, this person can't read. I mean, immediately this person is labeled or, you know, whatever, but it might just be that it has nothing to do with a problem, it could just as well be that there is no interest, the brain is not ready, the person is not ready to go through that process. So I think there's a lot of impatience for people to follow other people's um, schedule and children cannot learn on somebody else's schedule. They can only learn on their own schedule. So, yeah. yeah. So it's very, very likely that um, even if we are thinking of dyslexia as a neurological problem, that many, if not most, and possibly all of the young people being labeled dyslexic actually might just be um, perfectly capable readers, but their time has not yet come at the point that school starts demanding it. Yeah. Which leads me to the next question. Um, Ron Davis is one of the dyslexic um, minds that sorted out his own dyslexia and then came up with a, a method that he then made available to other people. Um, and he was one of the first to um, come up with the statement that dyslexia is more of a talent than a disability. Um, I'm very interested that he sees reading problems as a result of feelings of disorientation. And I'm wondering about that and your thoughts on it in terms of how the natural reading uh, learning process might be less disorienting than being taught to read. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, the, the, the main, one of the things that um, if, if we go to, uh, if we look at people in schools, is that we're never given the opportunity to self-correct. And the ability to self-correct is a very, very important ability to have. And you find that when children are uh, uh, following the natural learning approach, they have the agency to do that. So they will go through and then, oh, you know, uh, they've got the time, they've got the space, and they've got the freedom to be able to self-correct. So the thing about disorientation, I mean, I haven't read widely on, on, uh, on disorientation with dyslexia with the person that you talk about, but 
from what I know about natural learning is that you take away that space for, for, for young people to get to a point where they're all stressed out and they're anxious about performance and anxious about can I read or not. So if you take a typical example in a school, uh, a, a person will be asked to read in front of the classroom. And when they read, as soon as they make a mistake, there's giggles and, you know, and the whole, the whole setup, and then they just start cringing and, you know, going, because it's, it's a horrible, horrible experience. But uh, a, a, a person in a, in a home, a natural learning home, there's none of that. There's no shame. There's no uh, anxiety. There's no performance uh, sort of uh, anxiety. I mean, you're not standing there in front and, and reading in front of your parents, you know, uh, in, in your lounge or anything like that. Reading is so natural. It is such a natural part of your life. I mean, um, often uh, uh, parents of natural reading will, start, will suddenly get a, a surprise when they realize, hey, he, he, he's reading. You know, suddenly the Monopoly cards, they're actually reading the Monopoly cards and, you know, not asking you. So sometimes even the parent is surprised that, that suddenly this, this jump has happened. So I think um, if you follow the natural learning approach or self-directed uh, education, um, the one thing that you take away, and it's, it's a, a, a fundamental thing that you take away, is anxiety over learning, is this idea of being measured. It's this idea of performing to somebody else's expectation. And once you take away that, you create freedom. And when you create freedom, you create optimal learning environment. And I think that is what is lacking in institutions and therefore I mean, there's a lot of research done on it. There's a lot of um, sort of discussions around this question of this sudden explosion of learning disabilities and learning problems. And a lot of people are going back into looking at, you know, going back to looking at, is it the way people are being taught that's creating these anxieties? So, um, yeah, I think natural learning really uh, gives a person the confidence to be able to take take you know allow their own learning to grow and develop so when someone is 10 years old and they're not reading nobody's stressed about it you know it's fine we know there's trust there's trust and, and confidence and faith that whatever you need to learn will will happen and i think that in itself that is so empowering for for a young person yeah. That certainly I hope I'm fits. answering your question. Yeah, absolutely. And it certainly fits with the anecdote that we have from Sudbury Valley School about more than once a teenage, a teenager arriving, having been diagnosed, being functionally illiterate, and within a couple of months learning to read and being asked why. And the answer is some variation on, well, because nobody expects me to anymore. <laughs> And, uh, so that that your yeah your perspective yeah. really uh, I think gives a lot of background to why and how that would happen. Yeah. Do you but have any there, advice? There is, oh. mm -hmm. there is a you know if you look at it generally with natural learning, you will find that um, there will be a certain pattern. So there will be this interest. Suddenly they'll be asking questions, and in 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 their in their head or in the way they ask questions, you will be able to see that okay, this person now is sort of making a connection with this and that. You know, what is this or the sound of that? Or you hear sound playing going on. Uh, you know, spending a lot of time with books, and then suddenly one day they will read a book that's sort of fairly simple, and then and feel that confidence, and in no time you will read any text. The person will be able to read any text. So, um, I mean, it's with, one, with uh, one particular child, at four, she had the confidence to read. She goes, oh, I can read this. And as soon as that happened, it was like, okay, fine. And then that's it, didn't read for a year. Closed the book and said, I'm done. I'm, I'm not reading. I know I can do it, so I'm not reading anymore. And did not read for an entire year the parent continued reading. And a year later, picked up Charlotte's Web and read it from cover to cover. So that's the beauty of natural learning. 
the beauty of this process. I mean, how amazing it would be if all young people who went, you know, who are learning would just, you just take away all this anxiety around learning. How, I mean, the confidence, the, the, the belief in themselves. I mean, it's amazing. I, 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 I'm always so, uh, what's the word? I'm always so happy. I'm always so, I feel so good when I read, you know, when I come across these stories and I, and, you know, and I think how, how wonderful it would be if it could be for every, every person. Yeah. So also, I mean, I'm just picking up there that that 30 hours is not necessarily going to be 30 hours of an hour a day for 30 days in a row. And that's also no. probably where adult anxiety can come in, in terms of some of the patterns that I've personally seen might be very, very scattered over quite a long time. Um, and what you're saying there is that when we're able to really trust and support that autonomy and we know that we're providing the necessary soil in terms of immersion in a reading culture, um, there's no need for any anxiety that could interfere with the young person's confidence. Yeah, maybe I should have, I should have explained that 30 hours is not 30, 30 consecutive hours. No, it's like over a period of time, the most amount of time that you really need for what one would consider uh, a, an intervention where you're sitting and reading with the person or they are asking you questions and you're pointing out or, you know, that, that can take any form, but yeah, in general, they found that it can take 30 hours. So 30 hours and that's of anyone. effort. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And that could take over a couple of months. It could take over a couple of weeks. You know, it all depends on the person. It depends on the child. Um, so it's, um, it's a very, learning is a very personal endeavor. It's a very personal thing because learning is not separated from life learning you learn as you live life so once you make that a seamless effort then you take away all of the negativity around learning and then when there's no negativity then there is there is only a wonderful feeling of competence and a wonderful feeling of knowing i can do this the the thing is that also, you must remember, in, the, in our world, we place a lot of emphasis on reading because our world functions with reading, you know. But there are many communities where reading is not the main thing. I mean, if you think about a, a, a community living in the Amazon, I was watching a, a DVD of this community, and they build their houses like 20 meters up in trees, you know. I mean, there, whether you can say, you know, the cat sat on the mat, it, is certainly not important, but you do need to be, you know, be able to climb up a tree and, you know, living your life and going up and down. So you have to be very nimble footed. I mean, that's going to be the key to your survival. But in our world, yes, the key to our survival is being able to read. And, uh, you know, because, and it's not only books, because I mean, we are, we are, uh, with technology, we also, there's a lot of reading that happens with technology. So it's not only books or newspapers or whatever. It's also, I mean, you think about video uh, gaming, you know, you have to read, go to the next level. You, you know, there's a lot of reading that happens in, uh, in, in you know, in that uh, when you're engaging with, it, with technology. So reading is just part of our society and, uh, and it's a skill we need. And because uh, it is a skill we need, you can be very sure that people, every person will want to want to read. It is something just, that they will do. Yeah. Just like in that other society, you can be sure that every young person will make yes. the effort to learn to yeah. climb a tree. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So there is, there, 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 there is, I'm trying to remember who's the, the, the author, but uh, they did say that um, because reading is manufactured, therefore it needs to be taught. And I disagree with that. If you make reading part of your everyday life, you will want to read. So in, and, and actually the, the technology uh, also challenges that point of view because uh, if you look at, I mean, I think about myself as an adult and I look at my, my kids and, you know, they are able to, we are able to negotiate technology, you know, I'm, I'm not that good at it, but, you know, everyone else can negotiate technology. So, I mean, it is man-made. I mean, it is a, a, a device and we don't all go to class to learn how to do it. We we negotiated. So reading is part of our world. I can guarantee that every person who's in this world 
a child watching their, their being in the home, watching their parent, everyone's reading. That's what they want to do. I, I love that analogy you've drawn with technology, because as you say, technology is even more manufactured than reading. And who are the people we turn to when we need help with our technology? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, the people, it's the people who've been able to play with it. You know, that that yeah. playfulness is what you're saying is, you know, then there's no pressure. And that's really where learning takes off. Um, and mm. maybe my generation that feels more stressed about <laughs> learning the right way with technology is, you know, the one that has yeah. the struggle. Yeah. I think you've given us so much to think about. I hope so, yeah. Do you have any last words of advice to parents who might um, be facing the, the thought that their young person in their life is dyslexic? You know, like I say, I'm not an expert on dyslexia and, you know, so I can't, I, I can only say from uh, my readings and from my experience and just from a friend to a friend, it would be just to have patience, to have patience and to trust the process. There will come a time when if there is a problem more over and above the child, the person not being ready, uh, you will know it, you know. So the, the, you, as a parent, you will know it, you will see your child, you will know it. But for, I think for a long time, you don't need to worry about it. You just need to take the pressure off, enjoy life, read lots of books, you know, and don't dictate. You see, the other thing is that often as adults, we have certain rules in our head to say how reading must happen or when is it real reading? You know, so sometimes we think someone's not reading, but actually they're doing a lot of reading, but they're not reading what we think they should be reading. So sometimes we have to interrogate ourselves in terms of what are our rules around reading or how we see reading to happen. I mean, I, I remember when I was a kid, if you read a comic that was not reading, you know, so now if you, if you, I mean, I think about um, uh, my son who really, really improved his spelling by, by WhatsApp, you know, by doing WhatsApp messages. And before that, he, I mean, he, if, he, if he wrote whatever his, his, yeah, his spelling was, whatever, but just by doing WhatsApp messages and he was reading and writing on WhatsApp and that was, was amazing for his development. So we need to also move away from the traditional idea of when when are you reading and how and you know what do we place importance on we need to keep that slate clean so patience and yeah and trusting and being open to all sorts of possibilities and love you know love and kindness love and kindness uh, to your young person as you would say yeah <laughs> thank you yeah. thank you Jana it was, uh, it was good to chat about this <laughs>